Hey folks, my name is Aaron Aldrich and uh, I use they, them pronouns. You can find me on the bird app at Craze. And uh, please do, I would love to talk to you about this or anything really on there. I enjoy making new friends. But uh, today I'm here to talk to us about uh, community, really. And how can we work together in communities to do amazing things, uh, especially uh, and in situations where we don't have any power or we need to work against power. And uh, I'm going to do that all through the lens of internet game Blaseball. But to do that, we should probably talk about WTF is Blaseball anyway. Well, on the one hand, Blaseball is this web app developed by uh, game developers The Game Band. Uh, and it lives at blaseball.com. When you log into this website, uh, not right now because they're on a bit of a hiatus, but normally you get to pick your favorite team and you kind of see a list of all these made up fantasy baseball teams, right? Like the New York Millennials or Baltimore Crabs or personally my favorite, the Core Mechanics. You pick a favorite team and you'll earn coins based on the snacks that you buy and the events of every baseball game. And those games happen quite often. In fact, they happen every real life hour a new game occurs. And the results of those games are generally determined based on these kind of statistics that each player has. You can view their overall ratings or, you know, what type of blood they have or their soul scream. And every week, real life week, a champion is crowned for that season. And on one level, you can enjoy it there. It's just this fun fantasy game. But hold on, because going deeper into what makes this game an online sensation is like trying to do an autopsy on the Philly Fanatic. You see, all those star stats and the coffee type are sort of just the surface. There's all these other advanced statistics that live there. The ones here circled in red are just what has to do with pitching ability, including things like total number of fingers. This pitcher, I think it's Jolene Willowtree of the Core Mechanics, has 11. The most I've seen is 87. In fact, the minimum I've seen is 10, come to think about it. Joel Clark, engineer and designer from the game band, says, I describe a lot of it as just subconscious, just mostly thinking about what would be funny and, like, letting it happen. And that minimum 10 fingers thing is... Again, just where it begins, there's also weather to worry about. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, like, maybe they play in the rain or the snow. Well, kind of. They play in blood drain, where players from one team might drain the blood of another in order to become stronger. Or salmon that might reverse time, glitter, black holes, jazz that will, of course, improvise the weather. Uh, or solar eclipses, under which rogue umpires can incinerate beloved players. That's right, players can die in baseball, leaving their teams behind. And at the end of every season, it doesn't just end there. Of course, you can use your newfound wealth of coins to buy votes, like in any good democracy, and vote on decrees that might affect the outcomes and the way the whole league plays baseball. Or you might be able to bid for blessings, hoping that your team might be able to win Xenomorph and get acidic blood, which... Well, that's all we know about it. We just know that your team will have acidic blood, and that's kind of part of the fun of this game. You just have to figure things out as you go along. It sort of forces you into this community to make up stories about the players and the teams and what's going to happen and just forge ahead together. It creates this combined world where internet fandom and stories based on nothing and statistics nerds can sort of cram together and make something really cool with the band. Joel Clark again says, it was always like, let's make a game that centers around community and plays with it and see what comes out of it. Those incinerations I was talking about at the beginning, I, I showed R.I.V. at the bottom, which of course stands for Rest in Violence, but that wasn't a thing the developers came up with. The players came up with that phrase after the first player incinerated in a baseball game, Hades Tigers Landry Violence, 
was was incinerated, right? And so the players just took it upon themselves to say, R.I.V., rest in violence, and it took off amongst the fan base until it was canonized in Season 8 in the ticker across the top of the website. And fans continue to generate lore about players, so much so that players might have multiple conflicting backstories, except they invented the interdimensional rumor mill. Those stories don't conflict, they come from alternate dimensions. And so the wiki has a mechanical tool to show you a random piece of lore from a random piece of the multiverse every time you might visit a player's page. Look, there's so much lore, even the interdimensional rumor mill has a lore. This is the lore page for it. It's not the help page and how to use it. This is the story about what the interdimensional rumor mill is in the world of Blaseball. Uh, you can dig forever on this wiki and find fan lore forever. And Art. There is so much art. They start with, like, a player's name and just go back and forth bouncing ideas until something interesting comes out. You have on uh, the left here Kelvin Drum Solo, right? Great player for, again, the core mechanics. What should he look like? Well, maybe he has fire hair and rides a spider mech and plays the drums all the time. Or another one of my favorite players, Actual Swarm of Bees, Bees Taswell, who just announced their recent engagement to Inez Owens of the Boston Flowers, literal other swarm of bees. It keeps going. There are 42 albums worth of Blaseball inspired music on the game band, all under the garages of Seattle, Washington, not to be confused with Blaseball team, the Seattle garages. And in case you think it's just art and like, yeah, well, I'm not really into that. There are whole computer depths the folks at the Society for Internet Blaseball Research, or Cyber, realized this is a web game. We can pull the code off the web. We can dig into it and see what assets are there. We can learn about how the game works. They've created simulators that copy the game. They've dug through data for forbidden knowledge and deep statistics, and this is encouraged, right? The developers actually put the Society data witches into the game during their intramural coffee cup one time. You can actually find all of their information here on their wiki page, or not wiki page, right? Of course, on their GitHub page, right? Uh, we all know GitHub. They have everything here, including CRISP, the Columbia River Harvest Salmon model. And what else uh, wouldn't they have, right? And uh, that goes deeper into a whole other story at salmon.cyber.dev, the saga of Salmon Steve, right? Which I don't really have a ton of time to get into. Um, I would love to answer it in the Q&A. Suffice to say, it starts with the fact that Landry Violence got incinerated, and then they eventually learned about nitrogen spikes in a downriver fish population. Um, it's a fantastic story. Uh, to really sum up, this is what captures... Where does this Blaseball fit in? How can we see ourselves, right? Every time we're working within systems and sort of discovering them, whether we're developing against something that existed or we're operators, we always disprove things we thought we know about them. And so much more is it true in the wild world of Blaseball. Take this, for example. Of course, the home team pitcher and the away team pitcher must be different players, except for that one time Yosh Carpenter got switched to teams in reverb weather, like you do, uh, but instead refused to leave the mound, pitching the game both for the San Francisco Lovers and the Hawaii Fridays. Or how about these other moments, where a lineup player can't bat and be on base at the same time, certainly except for when Kelvin Drumsolo was the only player available in the lineup of the core mechanics, and at one point tripled themselves in thrice. Joel Clark again. Sometimes I think the community is making a game just as much as we are. And I think no better story shows this than the ongoing saga of Jalen Hot Dog Fingers. Uh, so to get the gist here, Jalen Hot Dog Fingers is a pitcher for the Seattle Garages incinerated outside of a game uh, unfairly in the very beginning of Blaseball. By the time season six comes around, they introduce idols. You can follow a player and idol leaderboards, and they realize they can idolize even dead players. There's also a blessing that season that the winning team steals the 14th most idolized player for their team, so the Seattle Garages hatch a plot to do a necromancy. They realize if they can conspire 
to get the league to put Jalen Hot Dog Fingers to the 14th most idolized position on the board and win the blessing, they could steal him back from the Hall of Flames onto their team, alive and pitching, maybe? Well, the devs, of course, realize what's happening and go full yes and. Yes, you should be able to bring players back from the dead, and necromancy should have consequences. When Jalen comes back, that joy of defeating death quickly turns to horror as they realize he is hitting players with baseballs now, causing them to become unstable and vastly increasing their chances of becoming incinerated themselves. And here's a great opportunity, I think, to start talking about anarchy. Now, I make light of that transition because I think it works well, but what we're not talking about is just pure chaos and fire. We're not talking about pure lawlessness. That's kind of the colloquial way folks use the term anarchy, but I'm talking specifically about the political idea of anarchism. The ideal of anarchism is a society in which all individuals can do whatever they choose, except interfere with the ability of others to do whatever they choose. So really, what this gets us into is how can we actually organize our communities to do cool things like resurrect Jalen hot dog fingers from the dead, when there's literally nothing we can do to compel them to do that. But it turns out that people will do interesting and compelling work because it's interesting and compelling. Like, look at the internet, the thing we build and work on every day. It started because folks thought, hey, this is a good idea. It would be interesting to build this and see what happens. Uh, so I'm going to use an example of the core mechanics, and uh, that's the team that I know. And here's the discord that all of Blaseball kind of lives in. You can see there's quite a few players to organize. There's 814 of us on the core mechanics. Uh, I had to show off the logo somewhere because I think this is just beautiful, the animated gif of which is moi. Uh, I have a hat with this, which I'll talk about later, and hopefully I'm wearing to the conference. Anyway, uh, when you join the Discord with the core mechanics, one of the first people to greet you will be Carlbot. Carlbot is our friendly bot, and you'll notice Carlbot is he, him. Uh, Carlbot's pronouns are in their nickname, most like just about everybody on that Discord, in fact. There's no rule about it, but everyone just sort of did it, which is really nice. And when it's extended so far as to include your bots, that's how normal it is. It makes it really easy for folks like me that might not be obvious which pronouns they use uh, to include them there. I don't have to bury them in a profile and hope someone looks them up before they reference me. I, they're just right there next to my name. As soon as I interact with you, you know, there's no questions. Um. That's part of it, right? This radical inclusion is a big thing about what makes this community work. Uh, so first thing, this kind of talks about checking out the vibes of the core mechanics, and I want to dig into that. What do we actually go for on this team? So the main vibe is right here. We all lift together, looking out for each other down here, because of course the core is down. The Earth's core is kind of down from wherever you are. Um, and here's the, the, the gist of that. We're all responsible for building a safe and inclusive community. We're committed to allowing everyone the space to express themselves while remaining consistent with the groundskeepers expect our space spaces to be. The, the groundskeepers are kind of like the main Discord mods for all of Blaseball. We're required to respect each other's personal interpretation of Blaseball canon and recognize that no one is beholden to anyone else's vision. And we expect each and every one of us to take responsibility for our own actions and the effect they have on our teammates. You see, that's all getting this concept, right? The first half of anyone can do whatever they choose is sort of super easy to achieve, right? It's this second part that we really have to hone in on, because if we're not keeping track of this, it very quickly runs away from us and ruins the whole point of the space. In fact, this touches on what we talk about, the paradox of tolerance. This is a concept that says to build any truly inclusive space, you have to be tolerant of everything except that which is intolerant. This is another situation where I think stories are really powerful, and I think the best illustration of the story is uh, something I read on Twitter, actually, at the middle of last year. I'm just going to read it back, because there's no improving or changing I could do on it. 
I was at a shitty crust punk bar once getting an after work beer. One of those shitholes where the bartenders clearly hate you. So the bartender and I were ignoring each other when someone sits next to me and he immediately says, no, get out. The dude next to me says, hey, I'm not doing anything. I'm a paying customer. And the bartender reaches under the counter for a bat or something and says, out now. The dude leaves kind of yelling and he was dressed in punk uniform, I noticed. So when I... I asked what that was about, and the bartender was like, you didn't see his vest, but it was all Nazi shit. Iron crosses and stuff, you get to recognize them. And I was like, oh, okay, and he continues. You have to nip it in the bud immediately. These guys come in, and it's always a nice, polite one, and you serve them because you don't want to create a scene, and they become a regular, and after a while, they bring a friend. And that dude is cool, too. And they bring friends, and the friends bring friends, and they stop being cool, and you realize, oh shit, this is a Nazi bar now. And it's too late. Because they're entrenched, if you try to kick them out, they cause a problem. So you have to shut them down. And I was like, oh damn. He said, yeah, you have to ignore their reasonable arguments, because their goal, their end goal, is to be terrible, awful people. And then he went back to ignoring me, but I haven't forgotten that at all. So that's the key to why we have things like codes of conduct at DevOps days. We need to ensure we're all in agreement of what behavior is good and shut it down if it starts deviating from this. Because those one exceptions begin to fester. But there are other ways we can foster inclusion rather than just pushing back the tides, uh, so to speak. And one of the things I love is the temp check that we have in our Discord. Uh, this sort of allows anyone at any point with whatever's going on to sort of just type temp check in chat. And uh, uh, what will happen then is Carl Bot, he will react to that with one of three reactions. Uh, and you can click on them to sort of cast your vote into how you're feeling, right? One with a green check is I'm fine. Uh, yellow says I'd like this to be toned down. And red says I'm not happy with this. Uh, and if anyone responds with that red stop sign, we change the subject, right? We just move on. Because what's more important is that you are here with us rather than we continue this conversation, right? We can move on, but we can't always bring you back into the fold. We want you to be here. You other just that everyone plays a little differently and that's okay, right? So Sundays were a snack that would reward you uh, when a player gets incinerated in a game. And so they say things like, hey, this season's gonna be rough. And when something happens, acknowledging the income is fine, being surprised at the amount is totally cool. Uh, but celebrating any given incineration is not. People have feelings about that, whatever, player, team, or otherwise. And they're probably feeling broken up about it. And likewise, don't come down on people using Sundays. That's also a legitimate way to play this game they're probably making the best of a bad situation. The point is to exercise empathy and be kind. Uh, forbidden knowledge is another interesting concept, right? Remember I talk about how cyber can pull out all this information, like the future schedule for your team, the actual baseball stats, right? What is your actual RBI for this player? All that type of information that's not available inside the game of baseball. Um, that's considered forbidden knowledge. And so if you're going to share that in the Discord, you have to spoiler tag it. Some people don't want to play that way, and that's okay. So we hide that to the point where they have to opt in to playing with forbidden knowledge. It's not just thrown at them. And there's the keepers and the reps here, right? So our team has keepers. They're folks that nominate themselves or get nominated by the community and voted on uh, to become, I'm sorry, those are the reps, not the keepers. Uh, the reps from our team will represent our team to other teams in the league or to the groundskeepers, right? Again, those are kind of the main Discord admins, the folks that make sure the Discord is the space it was always intended to be. And all that is sort of how we start to organize. We create this welcoming space, and that allows us to do some interesting things when we're coming up with team strategy. How do we want our team to play in the future? What big goals do we want to accomplish? I mean, there's classic things like 
regular discussion that happens in Discord, but when we have to take the temperature of the team, we do polls, right? We're thinking of making this sort of trade or going after this sort of blessing. How do you feel about it? Yeah, absolutely. I think trading that player is good for us. It will make us better in the long run. Let's do it. Or maybe, no, absolutely not. There is no way we are trading Bees Taswell to anyone. I love them so deeply. They must stay here. Also valid, because we're not going to trade a player away that the team loves. That would suck, just because some folks that like to play strategically and statistically would like that to happen. We still need to create the love for that team. We also vote. Uh, we had to do ranked choice voting recently in the most recent season, trying to determine where our team would go. We wanted to have collective strategy so we could all pull together in the same direction. So we voted. What do you want to do? Give us the ranked choice vote. Ask me about ranked choice voting or lurk up it yourself. It is far better than first past the post. And of course, we collect data from everywhere and document everything. This might sound familiar if you're in an open source product or working on any development team. We track our long-term strategy, our team's performance, the actual statistics, not just what the game shows us. We poll your votes, right? Remember we voted for where do you want to go, but when you actually chose in the game where you wanted, what did you vote for and how many votes did you put in? Even if it wasn't with the strategy we wanted or we collectively decided on, we want to know what you personally picked. So we have some way to expect what's going on and to rectify the votes with reality. Are we way off? Then maybe we need to try a different voting system. But there's no forcing you. There's no shame. We just want to know what you picked. So we have some idea of what's going on. See, these are all ways we can start to operate as many players, but one team. And that continues to echo throughout the game of baseball, because not only do we have many players, but one team, or as the Hades Tigers would say, many stripes, one tiger, we also have many teams and one league. And by pulling in the collective power of baseball fans, we can do some pretty amazing stuff that has some real world effects. And I think there's no greater example than the last couple of seasons of Blaseball. First is Blaseball Cares. This is a not-for-profit artist collective that sells baseball merch. I got this shirt there and the aforementioned uh, Core Mechanics Blaseball cap, and they donate all the proceeds to charity uh, two seasons ago to the Rainbow Railroad. And so far, since season five, donated 90,000 Canadian dollars to charity. Just because people bought merchandise they thought was cool that they would have bought anyway. The narrative designer for Blaseball says, on one level, Blaseball is a horror game. But it's a story, I think, for us about building a community amongst malevolent forces outside your control. And this is where I need to talk about the most recent season. Uh, all you need to know to get into this story is the coin which looks like that, is the boss of Blaseball. And I mean this both as the final boss of the game and the boss as in makes financial decisions about what Blaseball does. In fact, the coin tends to maximize growth and changes uh, in order to gain consumers, whether or not that's good for players or fans alike. Maybe sounds familiar. So this is kind of a summary about what happened, but there's all sorts of chaos. A number of teams, including the core mechanics, run off to the desert where we are scattered, um, which makes our names go wild. The, there's an oracle figure who kind of tells us rush the mound, which we interpret as go punch the coin in the face, which we do, uh, which seems to have been the correct narrative decision. Uh, some teams run off to the Hall of Flames. Uh, there's a giant squid who's the hall monitor, affectionately known as Binky, uh, who eventually says, I've had it, I quit. Uh, so quits Blaseball, uh, you know, goes after the coin and says, I quit, throws open the Hall of Flames, releasing every incinerated team, past and present, from Blaseball. It sort of leaves it looking like this, which is a bunch of nonsense, but a bunch of teams don't have names, a bunch of teams are on fire, uh, minor shout out to the Majorca Whales and Green Hill Hedgehogs as the most amazing names. 
Uh, and this is what our sort of map of the world looked like at the moment. Every team streaming out of the Hall of Flames in the top right. The charge led by the on fire now Hades Tigers, how poetic, charging the mound after the coin in unison, eventually bringing the flames to, to bear and melting the coin, which triggers a black hole which consumes all of Blaseball roll credits. So on one hand, it's a horror story. And on another, it's a story about what we can do together. You see, the final season was sponsored by the Bureau of Unity. And if we find out, the Bureau of Unity is a union training group run by volunteers, IWW members, and baseball fans who run training sessions throughout the year. They were hosted by baseball team, the Houston Spies, uh, on their website. And if you clicked on that Join the Bureau link, you'd have this greeting that came up. Peeling back the curtain and telling us Blaseball is a game about organizing, a game about mobilizing our communities and working together toward a common goal, even in the face of adversity and cruel gods with power far above our own. This was the Twitter account for the Bureau of Unity during that week. They include this image down here, which is what we would have called propaganda, what we spread throughout the Discord to try and convince other teams to join us in our strategy. And it says, fun fact, in our union training, we cover the March on the Boss via a roleplay activity. When all the employees come to get the Together, come to the boss together to make their demands. They can't be singled out, and they control the situation. So they ran signups and they ran a union organizing training that Thursday for five hours, and they had more people sign up for that than they had in the past number of times they had run this. So much so, they're continuing to run these into the future. Because the Bureau of Unity, the designers uh, of the game at the Game Band, the folks here, they get it. Blaseball is a game, but this is not. Only we can protect us in our communities. If you want to stop the abuses that happen at Ubisoft, Activision Blizzard, Amazon, Uber, Lyft, other gig workers everywhere, uh, the, the folks from Instacart, the gig workers have put a call out to delete Instacart to stop the abuses. Google, they have the Alphabet Workers Union, but how much more work is there to do? Microsoft, who kind of sounds nice from an open source perspective, but they are still, along with other folks, bidding on multi-million dollar and billion dollar contracts for agencies that continue to abuse humans at the borders and elsewhere. There's nothing we can do to stop them on our own. But together... <laughs> We can do great things. Even fast food workers, Burgerville workers, created the first fast food union in Portland, Oregon. And there's a lot of rocky starts. These are not small-term battles. These are long-term, ongoing projects. But at the very least, on the morning of August 3rd, when Burgerville closed one of their locations on 92 in Powell, the union was able to step up and start calling employees there and saying, what do you need? How can we help you? Because your workplace has closed. What can we do to ensure you are okay? And how can we mobilize to ensure you get back to work or get to what you need, right? That work doesn't happen if you're on your own. So this is the takeaway. You want to build cool stuff. Do you want your communities to help you build neat products or to accomplish amazing goals you can't do by yourself, you have to turn power over to the community. You have to yes and the interactions you have with other folks and let them take the reins. See what amazing stuff can happen if we just bring in more ideas and more people. You want to really change stuff? You're probably going to have to join a union. <laughs> 
so thanks uh, again. My name is Aaron Aldrich, and I'm at Crazy on Twitter. Here are some of the references. So this is your picture slide. Uh, please ask me a million questions about weird baseball stuff or organizing or community things, and I am happy to answer. Thanks again for having me. Uh, have a wonderful day.